So Emily, I understand you had the chance to talk to Bill Curtis. I did. Bill Curtis talked about whether the prairies can save us from global warming. Let's take a look. Welcome to a very special Spotlight interview. Today I am here with journalist Bill Curtis. So how are you today? I'm good. feel very good. good. It's great Thank to you, have Emily. you. Thank you for coming to our studio. Thank you. Good yeah. to be here. So you had the chance to speak at the University of St. Francis. Um, that's part of the um, Medeo Win Lecture Series. But before we go into that, tell me a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? Well, I started in Kansas. Um, my dad was in the Marines, and we traveled around until I was able to go to high school at the University of Kansas, too, then law school in Topeka, and uh, came here in 1966, right to Chicago. Oh, wow. So you went to um, the University of Kansas, you said, mm -hmm. and you studied law and journalism? Well, journalism and law, right, um, and decided not to become a lawyer no. uh, because <laughs> my talents, I think, were in broadcasting, <laughs> and uh, the world should thank me for not being a lawyer. <laughs> so, but why did you choose to study law and journalism, or journalism and law, that is? Yes, because uh, during college, uh, I graduated and said, I haven't learned a thing here. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and I knew that uh, law gives you a wonderful knowledge of how the government works, how our system works, and it's a specialty uh, rather than a general uh, you know, degree. And I knew I, it couldn't hurt, right. even if I didn't practice law. Right. And I was right. right. So I read that um, you were filling in for a friend, uh, for an anchor at for the 6 o'clock news, and a tornado ripped through Kansas. And you're famous in Kansas for saying, for God's sake, take cover. That's right. So can you tell me about that experience and how that kind of kick-started your career? Sure, it, it really did. Although I had 10 years experience in radio uh, before that. I started when I was 16. Oh, wow. 26 then, when I graduated from law school. It was in Topeka, Kansas. Okay. And I was at a law review class, and a friend of mine, who was the news director at WIBW, mm -hmm. the only station in town, <laughs> said, could you fill in for me on the 6 o'clock mm -hmm. news? I want to leave early for vacation. So I did the 6 um, at 6.30. Rather than going back to the law review class, they said, better stick around. We have some high winds coming in from Manhattan, Kansas, mm -hmm. a cold front coming through. 7 o'clock, we said, well, let's go on, give the all clear. So we went on, I was looking right at a camera, 26 years old, and I hear from the newsroom a two-way radio, and our cameraman is out at the southwest edge of the city, and uh, he's uh, calling in saying there's a tornado on the ground. On the ground, so this isn't a warning. Mm -hmm. I didn't give the alarm or right. warning because there was an old Indian legend that it would hit a hill and mm -hmm. dissipate. Um, but within about 15 seconds, uh, the second alarm came in, and it was from Ed. And he said, well, it's wiped out the Huntington apartment complex. That was 200 apartments. So in a fraction of a second, I drew a line like an arrow from the two points. It was headed for the Capitol building right in the middle of town, through hospitals, shopping centers, residential, and downtown is where it would go. My wife and child were on the campus there that married housing. And uh, I said, uh, for God's sake, take cover. Not quite that calmly. Uh, <laughs> they were able, to, uh, but you know, it was such a formative experience for me. How many broadcasters have the experience of uttering words that are, will mean life and death to people? Right. The mission was to get them into the basement and saying this was not a, just another alarm or a warning. Yeah, this is the real thing. And just out of the blue, this is the real thing. Uh, you know, it just changes our lives. In three months, I was in Chicago. Can you imagine how scary that was though at the time? I know. It was scary. Right. Um, I mean, it felt like uh, hysteria kind of welling up. I didn't know whether to cry or right. cuss or right. somehow impress upon people that this is important. Yes, extremely. Yeah. So you're a former anchor um, for Channel 2 News in Chicago, and you're also the narrator for the Anchorman, Anchorman yes. movies. Um, what other positions did you hold throughout your career life? I know you also have um, your own documentary, 
that documentary production company. Curtis mm -hmm. Productions can tell me about that, too. Well, I came back uh, in 1982. I left Walter Jacobson here in Chicago. Yes. I went to <laughs> New York. Everybody wants to be a network anchor. So I joined uh, Diane Sawyer in the morning for the morning show. And in 1985, came back to do a couple things. One, go back to my old job as an anchor. And two, start my own production company, Curtis Productions. Documentaries weren't hot in those days. They were closing them down at the networks. But, uh, you know, I kind of wanted to do that. This is a good lesson for you as a young person. <laughs> okay. If you set your mind, mm -hmm. focus in on what you really want to do, a lot of the problems or angst that you have kind of drop away. You've committed, you've chosen, and things just seem to happen. Oprah would say, oh, it's the, the flow or some divine guidance. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, you know, within four years, within three years, I guess, I was in the Amazon doing a documentary. Within four, A&E had picked me up and said, you know, we're a cable company. Uh, we're not making much money now, but we want to program documentaries. Why don't you be our documentarian? And it was 20 years. I did 100 Hi. shows called Investigative Reports, 127 called Cold Case Files, right. American uh -huh. Justice, and uh, it became a documentary company. Right. So I enjoyed the entrepreneur role, the business role, mm -hmm. and I had to morph out of you know anchoring in journalism right. into another kind of journalism. Right. right. So you be, be, be aware. Be prepared, and I was prepared with education, experience, and desire, uh, and committed, and things just happen. That's the way they work sometimes. Yep. So tell me, when did you realize that you made it big in the industry? That I had made it big? Mm -hmm. mm, you know, everybody's looking for an epiphany moment. <laughs> um, uh, you know, as a local anchor, Okay. You get a lot of attention. Right. You go into a restaurant, they always want you there, want people to see you, so they'll give you instantly a good table. Mm -hmm. So walking down the street, people always say, hi, can I have your autograph, and things like mm -hmm. that. So that dynamic, that experience as a, quote, local anchor is uh, really fun mm -hmm. because it's kind of a mini celebrity. You're a celebrity within your community, and but it's not too big. It's... It's like being, oh, well, uh, an athlete or a well-known person. Right. And it's more like a small town where everybody knows you. For Robert Redford or a Michael Jordan, um, it would be, it's, it's much worse because you can't go anyplace. Michael Jordan said that he saw the movie Ghost in his hotel room 13 times, which <laughs> meant that he didn't want to go out. Right, yeah. Uh, because everybody would swarm on him. Right. So me, I can come and go as I please, and right. the, the people are just nice to me. <laughs> That's great, though. Right? Yeah, I'm sure so it is. That. It's fun. It's been of a course. great run. So you spoke here at the university. Um, in your t it's part of the Medeoan Natural Tallgrass Lecture Series. Mm -hmm. And your topic was, Can the Prairie Save Us from Global Warming, correct? Yes. Can you give us mm -hmm. a brief summary about what this lecture series is about for those who don't know, maybe? Yes. Well, you have one of the great um, contributions to prairie to save tall grass prairie in the United States, 19,000 acres in the right. day one. Uh, and it's right here, close. But nobody appreciates it. I won't say nobody, hopefully somebody <laughs> does in Joliet, but very few people appreciate it for the value it holds. 70% of our carbon is held in prairie, you know, by, and prairie from original native grasses that have roots that go deep 10 feet, 15 mm -hmm. feet, holding all the organics down there, um, they can help save us. If we kind of change to a no-till agriculture, preserved and managed well our prairies, we could be down to 330 parts per million carbon mm -hmm. dioxide, you know, in, in a few years. 
that would be a rollback, which nobody thinks is possible. Right. And it's all due to prairie. You know, the Easterners will come and they'll say, my God, that's just weeds. Mm -hmm. There's nothing out there. It's flat. You know, it's a kind of scraggly, especially during the winter. They should see it during the real, <laughs> the real peak. Um, and for so long, just like the original pioneers, we have been, you know, thinking, oh my God, what an ugly thing. Mm -hmm. Well, we got, we're going to be thinking again because those grasses, there are more species of plants in the prairie than in a rainforest. The roots, roots go down mm -hmm. deep, 10, 15 feet, right. and they hold organic matter that is the great sod that we hear so much about in the prairie. That also holds carbon dioxide, the carbon, you know, that is causing the climate right. change. We've already dug up a million uh, acres and planted corn. Corn is not as good as native prairie. Mm -hmm. So a lot of us are trying to plant in the backyards mm -hmm. and do what we can to save it. Mm -hmm. We can bring it back, but not with really high corn prices. Everybody wants right. to dig up the front lawn. <laughs> um, and that's why we have to educate. Mm -hmm. We have to spread the word of the value. So, personally, why was it important for you to speak here at the University of St. Francis about this topic? I was invited, for one. Uh, okay. As a matter of fact, I was going to go to the prairie, uh, uh, you know, the park. And, uh, but I think our audience was going to be expected to be mm -hmm. too large. And also, I have an audiovisual uh, presentation. I will show you okay. some pretty slides. Awesome. That's great. Mm -hmm. So, what personal connection do you have to this topic? I own 65 acres mm -hmm. in a little town called Matawa, which is between Lake Forest and Vernon Hills. Mm -hmm. uh, most of it is in conservation easement. Mm -hmm. uh, now that's a commitment because it says for perpetuity, I give away the right, right. to uh, development. So on that, I have brought back, I have restored about 20 acres of tall grass prairie. I have an oak hickory forest. I have removed all the invasive species that I could identify, certainly something like buckthorn. Mm -hmm. um, and we give tours. We have a big garden. And nice. So I'm um, a lover of prairie. And I really feel committed to the people who also have committed to same, the same goal. Right. And, why save it. and why should people want to restore these prairies? Well, because of the value um, for global warming now. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition, why there is a great deal of uh, medicinal research that is being mm -hmm. um, conducted now on plants. Mm -hmm. We don't know anything right. <laughs> about the prairie and the plants. The Indians used every single plant mm -hmm. uh, for some medicinal use. Rattlesnake master, you know, is an antidote for a rattlesnake bite. Mm -hmm. um, certainly echinacea. That's a cone flower. Right. Uh, you can just go right down the line. Uh, we need to get in there and find, we may find the cure for cancer right there. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Sure, yeah. So what are some other effects to help restore these prairie? Well, you, um, first of all, we clear the invasive species. Okay. I, when I took over my first 10 acres, I cleared actually native hawthorn out uh, because mm -hmm. they had invaded uh, this prairie plot. And then you, I burn, I have burned. But tonight I will show you a, um, a clip that maybe burning isn't the answer, that we should let worms take over. Okay. Because they eat the trampled grasses and uh, turn them into soil. They are the ones who create topsoil. So it may be better for the land than burning. But that's still up. We still must right. uh, study it, right. research. And you're going to show part of that in your lecture. Mm -hmm. Great. So what benefits can prairies provide in easing the effects of global warming? Well, it's soaking up the carbon from the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. uh, you, they just bring it in and give out oxygen. Mm -hmm. And that is better than a rainforest, better than, maybe not better than the ocean, because the ocean also 
But uh, the grasslands, we have about 7 billion acres of grasslands around the world. If we manage them well, um, that would be an answer to the climate change. The problem is we have been changing the climate for more than 10,000 years. Ever since the age, age of agriculture came in, we started plowing. We started cutting the forest so we could plant. We became agriculturalists, pastoralists. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, blame the folks that started back there. <laughs> um, we have, with seven billion people, you know, speeded things up. Uh, so now it's become a crisis. Mm -hmm. And it's the worst we have. Yeah. So how are you or the people restoring these prairies? Well, you, uh, you don't. You burn them. Burn them. Uh, you can cut them. Um, you know, you get the dead out and give the new. But that's kind of, well, the Indians started mm -hmm. that because they saw the lightning strikes and wildfires. And then the buffalo moved in to lick the ashes okay. and get the minerals. They wanted the buffalo. So they started lighting the fires yeah. to attract the buffalo. We picked it up. Um, when we had cattle, we killed all the buffalo, we moved the cattle on, <laughs> and, um, you know, we wanted to emulate mm -hmm. the buffalo and, and their patterns. So uh, we started fire burning, and that's one way to keep it clear, keeps the uh, trees out. Um, and, and, uh, look, I, threw, I, I burned 4,000 acres in Kansas, yeah. you know, uh, in a single fire. Right. So I have advocated but in researching, I must say that I'm having my second thoughts. How long have you been researching this? Well, I've had my house for 20 years okay. um, with uh, the conservation easements there. Uh, about the same amount of time, I've had 10,000 acres in uh, Kansas. Most of, much of it, at least half, is under conservation easement too. And we're trying to reach this partnership so that you can have a working cattle ranch and promise not to develop it with a shopping or with a Walmart and set it aside so that it's set aside and will preserve the tall grass prairie. And Nature Conservancy, uh, if not a, a government organization, you know, will oversee it and we can live together. So, so what's going to happen if we don't restore these prairies? Well, we know what will happen with climate change. Glaciers will melt. Uh, that will stop the rivers from flowing. Think about Mount Kilimanjaro, mm -hmm. you know, in Africa. The rivers down here that quench the thirst of the animals really come from the mountain, Mount Kilimanjaro. Yeah. It's ice and snow is disappearing. What in the world is right. going to happen? So uh, it's, it's very serious, and uh, we're headed for what seems to be a real negative now. I wish there were hope. I wish there were something. I mean, all of us, look, look at California. Mm -hmm. They've just eliminated state water from 750,000 acres. So they'll either have to get it from groundwater or do something else. The people out there are now being asked, take shorter showers, because um, <laughs> we're in trouble. Yeah. They haven't replenished their reservoirs. Um, you know, that's the kind of dramatic effect that uh, changes in climate. Already Chicago, you know, in its environmental department uh, in City Hall has a new map of Illinois. And it shows how the climate has moved north so that southern Illinois may become Texas. Um, we may become southern Illinois. Um, we actually are in a pretty good spot. Um, <laughs> we have all the water in the world, mm -hmm. the biggest uh, supply of fresh water outside Lake Baikal. Um, so maybe people will, I thought people would start to come back from the Sun Belt <laughs> until this winter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Is there anything else you would like to add about your topic or in the lecture series? Well, I uh, 
I think that, that does it. Uh, the uh, the movie Anchorman has been fun, of and a, a real a real topic. I mean, a real uh, experience. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm on the edge like the big uh, the kid from the Midwest, <laughs> and we went down in the premiere. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with the paparazzi all there at the red carpet, and I got to watch. Uh, Will Ferrell oh, and yeah. all the stars. Sure, that was fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all I have to do is record some right. lines. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for coming. Emily, thank it you. It was great having you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Good. This has been another Spotlight interview. But Curtis made a great point about the prairies and global warming. He did. It is important to restore the prairies, especially in the Midwest.